Welcome to Babbles Park, an autobiographical dystopia of a brainless cyber whore. You're listening to Chapter 8, Grave New World. Under the veil of darkness, he walked nimbly back and forth on light-footed paws. His eyes carefully scanned the other side of the street, the patrons through the window of the cafe. He made sure he was alone and crouched behind a bush. When a cab pulled up, he turned and looked at the full moon tower clock. It struck at quarter past midnight. The interior lights came on and his date paid. Before she got out, she checked her lipstick in the makeup mirror. He tensed his limbs and scratched behind his ear. She got out, went inside, and sat down at the empty table right by the window to order. She looked a little nervously at her watch, took a drag on her cigarette, and paused, then she turned her head to the side, took an earring from her handbag, and put it on. He straightened his disheveled neck, bared his teeth, and let his eyes dart left and right once more, on the verge of jumping every second. When the pros echo came, it was just the right moment to cross the street unnoticed. While she absent-mindedly rubbed the stem of the champagne glass between her thumb and forefinger, he jumped to the window and heard her heartbeat. The glass shattered and her scream was stifled by a gush of blood. David kept dreaming, waking up in a cold sweat, blinded by the light. He massaged his aching neck muscles, coughed, <coughs> got up and went to the bathroom. He spat blood, looked in horror at the many cuts on his face and hairy body, and choked out her earring. <coughs> his wristwatch shrilled, now really snapping David out of his nightmare and back into park reality. Baby Lon smiled at him on the display. David, please be at the Instant Karma audition at the Media Center in half an hour. There's a lot waiting for you there. Cheers. Baby Lon smiling went out along with the display. I wonder what kind of place that will be, David said to himself and let the device automatically select the right music for his mood. He went into the bathroom and looked in the mirror, no blood. Relieved, he quoted Joe Gideon. It's showtime, folks. It was still early enough to kill time by listening to the introduction to the guided tour of the bionics lab, because I had no idea what it was supposed to be. My curiosity, therefore, drove me back among the people, eager to absorb what the lead researcher secreted after a brief greeting. What is bionics? Simply a word formed as a portmanteau of biology and electronics. Just as planes, trains, and elevators are computerized today, robots were implanted with new hips and integrated circuits as body parts as early as the last century. Artificial life was thus already present in the tools. Bionics to live healthier and longer, to be able to do more, to have more money. And eventually, be immortal, I added. How right you are. He said, looked at me, and continued. Eternal life is indeed the wish of many computer scientists. Okay, then the interest in neurobionics and nanotechnology, an interplay of medicine, neurobiology, computer science, and biomedical engineering, awoke. One of the goals was to replace lost functions of the nervous system. For example, an implant was developed to bridge the damaged nerve cells of paraplegics. Electrodes were used to control the interaction of muscle movements so that a formerly paralyzed man could walk a few odd steps. But see for yourself. A silly hologram of an old person appeared in front of us rising from his wheelchair, throwing away his crutches, limping a few steps with his arms raised, and grinning. This was later improved by the use of neural networks, which are ultimately also computer programs. So that the lame can walk again. And in the future, the blind can see again? No, this is already the present. The same neural networks enable the creation of an artificial retina that gives blind people vision, albeit simple. I waited in vain for a second hologram pensioner. 
Ladies and gentlemen, as you can see, our evolution has already taken leave of biology and is now pursuing cultural goals, its own goals. Until recently, we knew little about the function of our brain. But thanks to our research, we have been able to develop biochips that are a combination of electronic and biological nerve conduction, making the artificial contact bridges to cyberspace obsolete. As you may recall, data gloves, appropriate clothing, and goggles used to be a necessary prerequisite for performing operations or repairs in previously difficult or inaccessible places, such as nuclear power plants or the deep sea. By the way, you can get some of these items in our souvenir stores in the Inter Hotel. Even today, virtually present space travelers still control unmanned space stations. But we are now also able to establish a neural direct connection to the artificial world. If you would please follow me. This is where I went because my appointment at the beauty farm was coming up. You listen to the eighth chapter of Babel's Park. In the next chapter, Outcast from Society, David is cast by Olga for the instant karma show, who plays up her Russian charm offensive. Listen to the ad free version on Apple Podcasts now. To learn more about Babel's Park, visit Dr. Kalasana's website fuckup.coach. And to let us know what you think of this series, we look forward to your review on your favorite podcast platform. Thank you.